Okay, um, let's start. Hello and welcome. My name is uh, Fabio Gigi. I'm a lecturer in anthropology here at SOAS, and I'm also the chair of the Japan Research Center. Thank you very much for coming, despite the strike and all the many obstacles that have been put in your way. Thank you also for joining us um, online. Today will be the last event um, for this year, but we already have a line of interesting speakers set up for next. So please do go back and visit uh, the website. You can also subscribe to a newsletter so you'll get the information automatically. So now it is up to me to introduce the speaker for tonight, Dr. Jason Danley from the University of Oxford Brooks. He's a reader in anthropology. And he is here because he had. I want to say. I want to say something about juvenile delinquency that turns <laughs> into age delinquency. Uh, but I'm sure you'll find that um, in the talk. I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, Jason has written several books about the experience of aging in Japan. He's done extensive field work in Japan and also comparatively in England. His first book was called Mourning and Loss. It was published in 2014 by Rutgers University, and he has in between uh, published and edited volume um, that takes a more comparative um, perspective between um, Europe and, um, uh, and uh, Japan, which is called Vulnerability and the Politics of Care, Transdisciplinary Dialogues. And his recent, most recent book uh, that appeared this year is called Fragile Resonances, Caring for All the Family Members in Japan and England. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Dan Dan sorry, Jason Danley. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And yes, just to echo Fabio, um, this is wonderful to be here with all of you. And Thank you for coming out. I know it's cold. I know there are strikes. I know it's the end of the term and this is the last talk. Um, so I really, really appreciate it. And um, and thank you to Fabio for inviting me to come here uh, and be with all of you today uh, and to the JRC. It's my first time uh, doing a talk here for uh, JRC. So, um, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, okay, so the talk that I, I want to give today uh, is, uh, as you'll see here, it's, in, it's inviting us to make some connections between uh, different uh, disciplines, anthropology, Japanese studies, uh, criminology, geography, uh, critical gerontology. Uh, and I, I hope that there are some of you in the audience who uh, cross some of those disciplinary boundaries tonight, maybe more experts than me on some of these areas. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion and questions uh, afterwards, and also the folks online. Too. Are you going to tell them? Uh, huh? uh, no, I'm, I'm just told right. because the light is a bit, it's hard to see. All right. There is a setting. Sorry. Okay. Lighting Let's set control. the mood. Exactly. It's called mood lighting. Yeah. And uh, lecture mode with spots. Okay. Much better, right? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you. Um, right. So, um, I've been working uh, on uh, this uh, issue of, of, uh, of um, the aging prison population in Japan, or formerly incarcerated older people uh, in Japan uh, for uh, a few years now. Um, and uh, this talk is uh, kind of bringing together uh, a, a few different so sort of publications that I have in different stages of, of uh, publication process uh, at the moment. So I hope it is not too disjointed in, in my mind, it all sort of flows together, um, but um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm gonna touch on a lot of different aspects of it um, and uh, I hope it makes a little bit of sense. Um, and we can we can start to weave that together and hopefully the discussion and the questions will be able to facilitate that a little bit more. Uh, and uh, I, I promise to give you a, a very full uh, bouquet of of loose ends and, and things to pull on. Um, so um, lastly, I want to thank the Social Science Research Council and the Japan Foundation, whose Abe Fellowship Program funded this research. That's the little icon in the corner there. So uh, the title of this talk is uh, Aging Bodies and Carceral Circuitry in, in Post-Welfare uh, Japan. And it's going to touch on uh, all of these ideas um, 
uh, of aging, uh, of uh, criminal justice, and and so on. But it's also uh, in in a way a response, uh, my response to something that uh, Jason Scott recently uh, mentioned in an article in uh, American Ethnologist, uh, where he called for uh, an ideological ecosystem for abolition that spans academic, public, and militant spaces. So an, an ideological uh, ecosystem for abolition, what is that? Um, to me, that means imagining alternative strategies and institutions, um, envisioning different ways that we might transform society to better care for each other, uh, and to relate, uh, as Audre Lorde put it, uh, across our human differences as equals. So abolitionism, in other words, means dismantling the relationships that produce things like ageism, things that devalue the older person as non-productive or as irrelevant, um, that reproduce and naturalize ableist and neuronormative discourses and representations. And while ageism is, is nothing new, of course, only very recently have uh, older people been recognized as a group that has also been disproportionately affected by the current criminal justice system. Um, so uh, these different kinds of abolition um, conversations, I think, are coming together. Uh, and I see uh, ageism as part of that conversation. And that's what I want to contribute uh, a little bit to today in the example of Japan. Um, so why is it that age and, uh, and, and uh, uh, crime or these sort of carceral systems are coming together uh, now? Um, let's go to the next slide. Am I advancing slides? No, there we are. Um, okay, wonderful. So the received wisdom from the from the beginnings of criminology, um, such as the work of, of the statistic, uh, st statistical sociologist uh, Adolf uh, Quetelet uh, in 1831, has held up the notion that even today that criminal behavior peaks in adolescence or early adulthood. Uh, and then it tapers off and declines with, with age, uh, right? People age out of criminal activity. Um, this is sort of the received wisdom. Uh, and this age crime relationship model has been so persistent that some have concluded that it is universal and invariant and owing um, to the physical neuropsychological changes that occur uh, in all of us um, and irrespective of, of your culture, irrespective of your social conditions irrespective of history. Um, so this is uh, just one example of uh, something I, I, I found, you know, a recent study that again, sort of reproduces this kind of uh, knowledge that uh, crime decreases with age, right? Um, over the last couple of decades, however, a growing body of research has called attention to the uh, rapid rise of both the number of older people in custody and the proportion of older people with, uh, within prison populations in countries around the world. So the aging trend has largely been driven uh, by longer sentences, mandatory sentences, and the increased prosecution of historic sexual offenses. So um, even if that doesn't really challenge that age crime relationship, uh, it does mean that more older people are being affected uh, by the penal system. Um, so here's an example uh, uh, of that in, in, in England and Wales. Now, it was reported a few years ago uh, that the prison system is the largest care provider of older, frail um, men uh, in, in those countries. Um, and the, uh, in the UK, the number of, of prisoners over 50 tripled between 2006 and 2016, making, uh, again, this uh, a very large uh, uh, care provider. So this is a very rapid increase in the number of older people. Um, now, again, this might be for crimes that were committed while uh, folks were still uh, younger uh, and they were aging in the prison system uh, as a result of longer sentences, uh, or it, these might be historic crimes, right? Um, so a similar situation can be seen in the U.S., uh, where, again, one-third of prisoners are projected to be over the age of 55 by the year 2030, uh, the, a doubling in the span of a decade. Um, now, you'll notice I've been a little bit sloppy with my statistics here, um, classic anthrop 
apologist you know, error, perhaps, but um, the threshold for what constitutes an older adult uh, is kind of variable, right? Depends on the situation. Now, typically in research with uh, incarcerated individuals, um, the kind of threshold for being an older adult is, is 50. Um, but it can range between 50 and 60. And this is partly based on the, on the small numbers of incarcerated adults in, in the upper age brackets historically. But it's also uh, because that past health research has shown that those in custody are um, on average physically comparable to adults that are chronologically 10 years or so older. Um, so I'll try to return to this. This is one instance of a kind of uncanny doubling of the uh, carceral body uh, at this moment. But uh, in Japan, let's look at the case uh, in Japan now. Um, you know, in Japan, it's, it's pretty easy, actually, to find statistics, uh, not only of uh, uh, prisoners that are uh, over 50, but even over 60. Um, there are currently about 47,000 people in Japanese prisons at the moment. Uh, and um, uh, across 75 different Japanese prisons and detention facilities, I should say, and around 9,000 of those are over 60. Um, so similar to England and Wales, the number of older adults in Japanese prisons has, uh, and this is the number of older adults, 65 and older, uh, has tripled between 1999 and 2019, while the proportion of the overall prison population has quadrupled. What is most striking, however, is that in contrast to prison populations elsewhere in the world, the majority of older people in Japanese prisons are serving sen sentences for offenses committed as older adults. So unlike uh, these other countries, Japan's case does pose a kind of challenge to this age crime relationship that we're all used to, we all assume, and really that the prison uh, institutions are, are largely based on. Um, so uh, while Japan's overall crime rates are at their lowest in decades, 22% of all arrests are people over the age of 60. And the great majority of crimes committed by older adults in Japan are nonviolent property crimes like theft, uh, shoplifting, uh, and um, things that are classified as fraud, um, such as going to a restaurant and leaving without paying for your meal, right? Musein um, Shoku. Um, so with uh, these, most of these have short sentences, less than two years, but with repeated offenses that, that can get longer. Um, so, and a lot of these offenders, uh, of course, the older offenders are living with intellectual or cognitive disabilities, uh, and an estimated 14% are living with symptoms of dementia. And these are just the, the folks that are in, in prison. Um, so this is a, um, a chart. It's a little bit old uh, here, but I just want to give you a sense of the picture. This trend is largely continued. It's, it only goes up to 2013 here. Um, right here, uh, we have the number of new uh, older inmates by uh, history of imprisonment. Um, so the, the top part of that bar uh, are people who have a history of being in prison six times or more. That middle sort of green bar are people who have uh, been in prison two to five times. And uh, the light blue bar at the bottom is uh, first time offenders. Um, so you can see very readily from this graph uh, that as we have more and more older people in prison, you also see uh, that large proportion uh, are uh, recidivists, right? Um, when we look at the elderly rate, that's the percentage of new uh, older inmates among all new inmates. Um, right here, it says uh, 9.8. Now the number is more like 12%. So it continues to grow, continues along this line. Um, and so we not only have an increased number of, of older people uh, in prison, um, but they're characterized by this, um, by reoffending here, reoffending rate. Okay, um, so uh, those over 65 has, have the highest uh, recidivism rate of any age bracket in, in um, uh, any age bracket in Japan. And this again is quite unique. Usually it's younger people that have, are more likely to, um, to reoffend. Uh, in Japan, it is those over 65. Um, the great majority, I'm um, sorry, um, 
Right, so more than one in five will return to prison within two years of release, and almost half of these um, of those reoffenders will be arrested within the first six months. Uh, if we extend our sort of post-release period of five years, the rate jumps to almost 50 percent. Uh, around 70 percent of older people arrested uh, are recidivists, and those with uh, six or more prior offenses now make up the majority of older incarcerated people. Okay, so why do uh, so many older people keep returning to prison? Um, that is a good question uh, and a complicated question. So I wanna try to unpack it a little bit here. Um, so between the years about 2016, 2018, the, the year I began field work uh, in Tokyo uh, on this problem, several major international news sources were asking these same questions. Uh, about uh, how can we understand this aging prison population, uh, including the Financial Times and Bloomberg and The Atlantic and BBC, all featured stories on Japan's aging prison population. And most shockingly, according to these reports, many of these older people felt that incarceration gave them a sense of relief and comfort. They felt cared for in prison in ways that they didn't feel when they were living their lives on the outside. So an article in, in Bloomberg Business News, for example, listed several profiles of incarcerated women, including uh, Miss T, uh, age 80, who was serving her fourth term of two and a half years. So her crime was stealing codro, seeds, and a frying pan. Two and a half years. Uh, when they interviewed Ms. T, she explained, I was imprisoned for the first time when I was 70, when I shoplifted. I had money in my wallet. And then I thought about my life. I didn't want to go home and I had nowhere else to go. Asking for help in prison was the only way. My life is much easier in prison. I can be myself and breathe, however temporarily. My son tells me I'm ill and I should be hospitalized in a mental institution and take it easy. But I don't think I'm ill. I think my anxiety drove me to steal. The uncanny appearance of the odd yet ordinary collection of stolen goods is as strange as the accompanying photograph uh, in the story of a woman standing in a factory by a sewing machine, dressed in drab khaki prison uniform. Both of these images felt hauntingly lonely in different ways to me. So I imagine these objects composing a kind of domestic still life, but a, a strange one, a kind of alien imagination of home that suggests acts of feeding or being fed, yet in a way that was incomplete and unable to, to satisfy. The pieces didn't quite come together. They indexed but did not embody homeliness. Listed in a police report, the objects take on another social and ethical meaning as, as evidence, not of grief, of a lost home, not of a broken family, but of a crime. I thought about my life, Miss T reflected, and I didn't want to go home. So the photograph, too, evokes this sort of context of gendered domestic work. She's there at a sewing machine, uh, and yet she is in this uh, strange environment. And there's this uniformed figure there in the shadows. And we're unable to see the look that passes between them. We can't see his face, and she's turned away from us. But we, we might be led to wonder what's going on there. Is he a protector? Is he a threat? Um, is she looking at him the way she looks at her son who says she should go into a mental institution? Um, is he a paternal figure, right? After all, the sort of prison slang for correctional officers is uh, oyaji. Ms. T's statement, I can breathe, uh, I can be myself and breathe, uh, inv inverts the conventional view that prison is a space where one is cut off from the world, caught, confined, stripped of autonomy and individuality. But for Miss T, it was the world outside, including her relationships with her family, that made her feel 
anxious and trapped and suffocating. Away from this world, she exhaled. The circulation between self and the world was restored in this act of breathing. But how could home become so unhomely while the carceral could be a space to breathe? So at many points during my research, I would hear formerly incarcerated people tell me things like, life in prison was easy, but life on the outside, that's hard. For them, like Miss T, it seemed that the normal order of things had been inverted. Prison was like home, home was like prison. Life followed this rhythm of catch and release, repetition and return uh, back and forth. In this context, I came to see the carceral, a kind of logic that links practices of discipline and control across spatial and temporal sites as constituted not primarily by discrete institutions like laws and courts and prisons, um, but uh, by the kinds of bodies and affects and subjectivities emerging through this process of circulation, back and forth, in and out, the stitch work between worlds like breath. And so what was helpful for me in thinking through these kind of ideas of recidivism and repetition and the consonance between, the sort of resonance between the out and the outside and the inside uh, was this notion of carceral circuitry that I take from uh, carceral geography. Bless you. So uh, this is, comes from uh, an article by uh, Gill uh, and uh, Conlin, Moran, and Burridge uh, on carceral cir circuitry. And they write that uh, in this, uh, piece, our intention is to make the notion of circuits do fresh work by exploring the real material and lived circuits that compose carceral systems as the basis for a new analytical window onto the empirical reality of interconnection across between and within, across between within and beyond carceral institutions. Um, so they recognize that you know, they're not the first ones to think about the way circuits work, the way in which the movement of people, the movement of bodies uh, has been uh, theorized uh, in, in the past in, in ways that um, create value, for example, in ways that reproduce a, uh, a population of, of surplus labor, uh, for example. Um, so we can talk about this this circuitry, but they're very interested in this idea that these institutions like the prison, which seem very uh, immobile, where you feel very stuck, uh, there are these big walls that you can't get beyond, are actually quite porous. And there are, are things that are moving in and out of prisons. Um, and, uh, and so we have to look at that context of movement. At the same time, uh, they emphasize that circuits are closed, right? There is a kind of enclosure that's at work in this circuitous process. Um, and so that is also uh, important to recognize uh, in this. The other idea that uh, goes along with this and builds on this is this notion of carceral churn. So car uh, again, carceral geographers have adopted the term to describe both the violent movement of this circulation and the mechanistic quality of kind of churning out these carceral subjects. So while carceral churn has mainly been applied to the kind of processing of individuals uh, moving between prisons and jails and court holding cells and other sites of detention, other sites that we would normally sort of, you know, picture as, as places of, uh, of detention. Um, I want to try to sort of expand the scope of this and um, think in terms uh, of the carceral a little bit more broadly. Um, here I have, I have a quote from um, this, this article by uh, Russell, uh, Carlton, and Tyson uh, on carceral churn, where they say that carceral churn refers to the production of carceral subjects via the disciplined movement of people through the carceral circuits. This process, we argue, maps criminality onto bodies and feeds into a larger political project that funnels public funds towards police and prison buildup. So they're 
discussion is more focused on, on that political project uh, here. Again, I want to try to think more broadly uh, and think of other kinds of circuitry, and especially how this plays into the lived experience uh, of older adults and how they experience um, the process of aging alongside this process of churn, right? Okay. So, um, great. So in the process, I want to include places um, where older adults might go after they've been released from prison. Um, these kind of flop house rooms, these doya uh, in different uh, low-income enclaves, um, life on the streets, or maybe different administrative offices that they have to uh, face to, to get different kinds of benefits and so on. Um, other spaces that reproduce forms of marginalization or exclusion, uh, as well uh, as um, things that uh, push them to back towards prison. Um, so let me let me turn to to an example from my field work now. Okay, so this is G, short for uh, Oji San, right? And now G was the uh, the oldest recent uh, graduate uh, from prison, uh, housed and aided by an organization called Mother House uh, that I volunteered for during my um, field work. Uh, Mother House is an uh, a nonprofit organization that aids in the resettlement of recently released um, uh, offenders and uh, ex-offenders, um, not necessarily older people. But um, I first heard about G about a week into my field work when a phone call interrupted an interview I was having with the director of Mother House. So he took the phone call, and when he came back from from the from the call. He sank into his chair and he let out this big sigh and he said, he's done it again. 72 years old and he's gone and got arrested again for stealing 20 yen out of a shrine donation box. 20 yen is about 12p in current exchange rates. But because of his record, because he's had prior uh, um, you know, uh, history of, of incarceration. G was facing up to a year in, in prison for this latest incident. And if it wasn't for the director of Mother House, who went to the judge to plead to have G's sentence suspended, uh, it's very likely that he would have served his time. Um, having had a stroke about 10 years prior, he, uh, he had quite pronounced um, speech impediment. He was very difficult to understand. He would get very frustrated as well when people couldn't understand him. Uh, he could be very sort of temperamental. Um, but he also often became confused. Uh, and, you know, some of us suspected that the stroke uh, and aging might have affected his cognitive functioning as well. So he's not someone who would perform very well uh, in one of these formal courtroom kind of uh, environments. So although he was soon uh, released from detention with a suspended sentence, uh, during the week that he was in detention, he lost his livelihood assistance benefits, his seikatsu hogo uh, that he was living on. And as a result of that, he also lost his apartment. So he was coming out of detention. He was released, but he had nowhere to go and he had no money. Uh, the landlord uh, from his former apartment found the apartment in terrible shape. There were holes in the walls and things like that, garbage everywhere. And so the director of Mother House had to find a way to pay for these damages, uh, pay back rent and so on. Uh, and he wasn't too happy as well. Um, but he did get G resettled as you see him here in his new place. Uh, and several other ex-offenders and I would drop in like on occasion and bring him food or, or cigarettes or things like that, check in on him. On these visits, we'd usually sit uh, on this, um, this bed here. It's one of those sort of uh, adjustable um, kind of hospital beds that you can get. Um, and um, because of his mobility problems, uh, G would rarely leave this bed or this room. We might watch sumo on TV, as you see here. And G would drink green tea out of an aluminum can that used to have pineapple chunks in it, according to the label. We would sit together for long stretches, often in silence. Sometimes he would turn away from the TV and he'd rummage through some papers on the table 
on, uh, next to him. And some of these were papers from the ward office or different documents about his benefits or uh, health appointments, uh, things like that. He would read them, kind of look at them, read through them, go over them, might show me, put them down, pick them up, read them again, put them back away. The one personal item that, that stood out to me in his room, though, and you can kind of see it in the back of all of those papers, was the funeral portrait of his mother, propped up behind a small bowl for incense. Naturally, I asked him about this portrait. I look like her, don't I? He smiled. And I agreed. Will you be buried with her? I asked, curious about their connection. No, I never got enough money for a proper stone for her. But nothing I can do now. I don't want anyone to be fussing over me, spending money when I die. And then he smiled and said, I'm Muen Botoke, a disconnected spirit, a ghost. Now, the notion of the uncanny is often associated with ghosts, with the supernatural, things that are just out of sight, spectral traces, nowhere, but nonetheless, unquestionably there. We might uh, think about, uh, for example, Susan Lepselter's work, uh, her ethnography of uncanny experiences of UFO abduction, uh, or the uncanny voicings of the spirits of the dead channeled on the otherworldly volcanic landscape of Mount Osore uh, in Marilyn Ivy's ethnography. G not only lived with the ghost of his mother in a way, but he too was a kind of ghost, disconnected, without a sense of home, between worlds. He hasn't had contact with any of his family members since the uh, first time he was in prison, uh, including his daughter, and they've become completely estranged since then. Um, the narratives of the uncanny are always interrupted by the unsayable, these long moments of silence that we spent together. <laughs> Why did he steal the money from the donation box? I couldn't help but think about that again and again. He just gave a shrug. I was hungry, he would say. Um, now, in Freud's famous work on the uncanny, we might remember that he recounts the shocking encounter with old age, his own age. Uh, he's sitting alone in a train compartment uh, when the train is jolted and suddenly he sees what he calls an, an elderly gentleman invade his compartment, only to realize that this figure whom he expressed a, an immediate dislike for was in actuality his own reflection in the looking glass of the open door. In this anecdote, the old man is at first seen as a trespasser onto Freud's private room, his uh, disrupting his work, his sense of security, uh, instantly filling the air with tension. He was unrecognizable at first as the devil. In other words, he was this part of Freud that Freud did not wish to recognize. Um, Kathleen Woodward calls this a future absence, right? Old age, the thing that we do not wish to recognize. So the figure of the double then, which is nothing more than something that is familiar, returning in distorted form, is uh, also described by Lep Selter again as the return of, of what we cannot bear to know. Again, the unrecognizable thing that we do not wish to recognize aging. And so I think there's a, a certain resonance with this repetition, right, uh, of uh, age, uh, also the repetition of, of uh, recidivism uh, that's going on here. And I want to try to draw these two uh, together uh, in a way. So, uh, and, and we see that here. Often G would also uh, uh, sit on his bed sort of looking outside or looking at himself in this reflection, again, in silence, confronting, in a way, uh, this figure of, of aging. So just as we had this, re this repetition and this double, this, this uncanny uh, eruption 
uh, of, of age uh, in Freud's example. Um, you know, I think that, that we're seeing here with this growth of the, of the aging prison population, another kind of example of this, this sort of eruption, this sort of return of what has been um, repressed in society, right? This dark side of aging. And I don't think it's a uh, coincidence necessarily that we see uh, a rise, a rapid rise uh, in the older prison population. Uh, at the same time that we're seeing a kind of deinstitutionalization uh, of elderly care, uh, at the same time we're seeing uh, a uh, amping up of this discourse of successful aging, active aging, right? These models of uh, living well in the community, right? Aging in place, uh, all of these things. We're bombarded in Japanese society by this notion that we have to take responsibility for age uh, and to be uh, fit and healthy um, to the end of our lives, right? This notion of this compression of, of morbidity. Um, and yet this doesn't really fit the, the reality of the situation, right? Where in a lot of ways we see um, what has been called the post-welfare state, right? Uh, or what others have called the refamiliarization uh, of Japanese elder care. Um, where we, um, the long-term care insurance system uh, that is there in place, um, that is, is, is promoting this ideal of, of independent aging, uh, healthy aging, successful aging, um, is not uh, able to relieve the burden on, uh, on families and, and families are less and less able to uh, care for, for older family members. Um, and so we have more and more older people who are living alone, who are living isolated, um, and who are increasingly also living uh, in poverty uh, and in these kind of uh, situations. Um, so in many ways, I found this similar, this went to research I had done previously, uh, on uh, in, in communities and on, on care of, of older people uh, where they were really worried about kodokushi or these so some lonely deaths. Um, I see this loneliness as, as something that is, is running through this. Um, but if we promote this kind of successful aging model, if we choose to see that kind of aging, which in a way is an anti-aging or a no-aging uh, model of aging, um, then the more we try to repress and the more that we see this return uh, of this sort of dark side of aging, the more we see the criminalization of older people who are not connected with family uh, and who uh, are reminding us uh, of this, uh, the deviant body of aging, not the, not the she kind of picture of, of, of welfare. Okay. Uh, there's also a kind of utsukushi, beautiful kind of picture of, of rehabilitation after um, what is called rehabilitation or resettlement or recovery uh, after prison. Um, and this all other kind of circuitry that is imagined in this uh, paradigm. But for most of the older formerly incarcerated people that I talked to, this, this kind of uh, thing didn't make sense, right? One said, I don't understand this business of, of rehabilitation, right? Shakai uh, fukki or fukatsu, that everyone's talking about, right? Another, another older ex-offender told me uh, when we were, this when we were looking at these kind of uh, flyers for recidivism prevention campaigns, right? This is Hogo-chan, he's sort of the, the mascot, of course, for the uh, probation and parole system in Japan. That's supposed to inspire you to stay out of prison. Um, so he said, I, I can't return, right? I can't return as rehabilitation and things like that kind of uh, suggest. I can't return to the way things were. And anyway, if I did, I'd probably end up doing the same things that got me into prison. So I, you know, I'm looking for work, but no one wants to hire an old guy. There's nothing to do. I asked another man how he felt uh, since his release only a couple months earlier. Um, and he said, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in there. It's in, I have this feeling, my kokoro. I don't really know how to explain. I don't think I can face other people. And I can't tell anyone 
about where I was or what I did. So it's like this wall or fence between me and the life of ordinary people, even though he was outside. Uh, again, that image of, of capture, of suffering, of enclosure in that carceral circuitry. Compelled to go back, to resettle, to reintegrate, to recover, right? Trying to move forward, blocked by the aging body, by the stigma of incarceration, by administrative systems of welfare uh, and bureaucracy, uh, returning again to custody, older ex-offenders were caught in the carceral churn. Okay. I'm gonna switch settings a little bit. And some of you may recognize this. Another place where I did a lot of uh, my field work um, and learning about aging and carceral churn uh, was Sanya. Now, Sanya is an area of a few blocks in Northeastern Tokyo. Uh, it used to be a major day labor hub uh, until the work stopped and the workers got older. Uh, now some call it a kind of Fukushima machi, a kind of welfare town. As I walked closer to the center of town, the building facades and the fonts on shop signs that maybe used to exude a kind of useful exuberance now looked very just dingy and, and dusky with spatina of, of age. I recognize this kind of landscape from my time growing up in Detroit, felt kind of familiar. Um, Sonia seemed like a place where time had stood still and where you could get trapped if the iner in the inertia if you stopped walking for a moment. So I was on my way that day to visit uh, a, another nonprofit that provides temporary shelter and support uh, to people who are poor and unstably housed. The more and more of the people that they help are formerly incarcerated older men and women referred to them from the local community resettlement support center. As I was approaching my destination one day in Sanya, I was called over to join a small group of men seated on the ground in a narrow strip of shade across from a small bar. Um, when I told them that I was there to learn about older people who had been to prison, and they laughed. And they're pointing at each other and say, oh, you know something about that. I turned around and uh, then one man turned around and he lifted the back of his shirt up and showed me his tattoo. And then another one sort of, you know, just kind of brushed that off and said, hey, there's a lot of guys in the prison nowadays. Most of the old guys around here and Sonia have been to prison a few times. But if you want to know, ask granddad over there. How old are you, granddad? A <laughs> hundred? And he's been to the worst of them. So they motioned over to, to another older man who was sitting on a metal folding chair. Uh, drinking with the others. And while they all had some gray hair, this man was clearly older than the rest. While they had been joking, he had kept statues still, just kind of staring out over them. He appeared very frail, in fact, and hardly the way that one would imagine someone who'd been to prison several times. So I asked him if he had been to prison, and he nodded. So why do, why do people go back? I probed. And he looked at me sternly. Oops. And he said, you've been in once, you go a second time. If you've been in twice, you go a third. I waited for him to continue, but he simply leaned back and lit another cigarette. But the old man's words looped around in my head the rest of the day. Now, I'd known that you know, if you had a history of past incarceration, that was probably the greatest predictor of future incarceration. But it was the way that he said this, right? The cadence, the rhythm. If you've been in once, you go a second time. If you've been in a second, you go a third, right? It reflected this kind of temporal swing of life in places like Sonia, where things appeared both heavy and simultaneously in motion, right? This kind of atmosphere of, of churn. The aging of the Sanya population that my interlocutors reflected was something uh, evident from the field work I conducted while accompanying the volunteers and NGO workers. Most of them, uh, those the folks that I met in Sanya were economic migrants from rural provinces, spent their adulthood in precarious work, 
had no savings or pension security in old age. The average age of those registered for day labor in Sanya uh, is 62 years old, uh, and a large portion, uh, I don't know the exact number, I've seen different numbers, as much as 90%, receiving uh, Seikatsu Tsuhogo livelihood assistance, uh, like G. The jovial warmth and free-spirited charm that marked the day of benefit disbursement, which is the day I met these guys on the road, um, was short-lived and like life in criminal communities was full of betrayals. One reformed yakuza I met described places like Sanya uh, as a world without affection, love, connection, a world of loneliness and solitude. Where friendships only exist for a moment when there's money and drink around uh, and then uh, they're gone. So as the days passed, the high spirits would fade and the numbers in the soup kitchens, places I volunteered would swell 200, 250, 300, warming up uh, with a bowl of stew or curry and rice until finally the next payday would arrive. This regularity was always disrupted, of course, by the contingencies of life, health problems, removal of benefits for some reason or, or another, and of course, arrests. Sometimes one would cascade into the other cycling within different repetitive iterations of the carceral. Um, the cycle of suffering that characterized everyday life in Sanya resonates with a kind of Buddhist worldview taught by prison chaplains since the 19th century in Japan. Um, Ex-offenders still refer to life outside of prison, oops, uh, here as Shaba, a term derived from Buddhist moral cosmology referring to the mundane world of illusion and suffering, a world where actions have consequences and transgressions bear karmic punishment. For the older ex-offender, Shaba was not only a place outside the wall, uh, Heino Soto, but a time out of joint, momentary comforts, uncertain survival, uncanny repetition. If there's an image of Shaba that haunts me the most, <laughs> it's this one in Sanya. Um, this is a, a, a temple there um, that's located uh, near the uh, grounds of a, that used to be an execution grounds, right? Uh, located in Sanya. You can see on the banner there, uh, something that's recognizing uh, that former execution grounds there. So this was the place uh, where the, uh, the bodies, the remains of those executed uh, would be uh, interred, taken care of. Um, these execution grounds were located there until 1873, and this was about the time the year of the first prisons in Japan, first sort of modern prisons in Japan. Uh, so it symbolizes this kind of transfer uh, of uh, from one kind of mode of, uh, of, of discipline and punishment to another. So while the execution grounds have been erased from the landscape, the traces of its violence still haunt. Uh, this massive stone statue of the Bodhisattva Jizo, and this is the Kubikiri Jizo, or decapitation Jizo, uh, still watches over the ground. Uh, in Japanese Buddhism, of course, Jizo stands at another bridge, uh, watching over the souls passing from one world to the other. Stone and spirit, stillness and moving, the image was a kind of spectral thread that knit these worlds together. For most formerly uh, incarcerated older people, Shaba was still a place, uh, could also be a place of refuge uh, as well, where one might hope to find a little bit of work, get signed up for some benefits, get some help from a charity perhaps, um, at least remain inconspicuous and avoid the kind of stigma of incarceration that you might get outside of those kind of areas. For formerly incarcerated older adults without a place in the normative temporal modes of belonging, such as family or work or community associations for older people, uh, the precarious freedom of life outside prison had its limits. Prison life wasn't free, I was often told, but at least it offered a kind of rhythm and a sense of regularity and even care or a sense of home. Um, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here. Um, right. 
So uh, one of the staff members uh, of this uh, nonprofit uh, that helps to resettle uh, older individuals uh, tried to explain to me. Uh, he said that in prison, uh, you don't have uh, you don't have to think about anything. In the world with others, second, you have to think uh, you have to think about everything. You have to worry about things. Uh, renting an apartment. What should I do for food today? What will happen if my livelihood assistance runs out? You have to think about so much. In prison, there's none of that. The staff member echoed the sentiments of uh, other advocates of, of aging and, and uh, disabled people like uh, Yamamoto Joji, who noted that older serial reoffenders see prison not as punishment, but rather as a refuge from the cold and harsh society. The society that perhaps that does not want to recognize them, that does not want to see this double in them. Um, these days, specialists, okay, this is sort of a classic depiction probably of a of a, a cell uh, where uh, people would be um, uh, in, in a Japanese prison. Um, but things are changing in this, right? Specialist facilities are now being made to accommodate older and frail individuals. Um, special accommodations for cognitively impaired uh, prisoners. Meanwhile, juvenile offender facilities are starting to close or be consolidated. Uh, and prisons are, are having to hire uh, staff who are professionals in elderly care uh, and train correctional officers to, uh, officers to accommodate the changes in care, understandably prompting comparisons to homes, nursing care homes, right? So this line between, again, the carceral uh, outside and inside is ble being blurred. Um, I'm sorry, I'm skipping over a little bit, but I'm happy to... <laughs> come back to these kind of thoughts uh, as well a little bit later. Um, but I'm gonna wrap it up. I don't want to leave us on such a dark note here uh, in a way, because uh, again, I'm trying to respond to this call for um, imagining an ecosystem for abolition, right? And imagining alternatives to this carceral circuitry, to this carceral churn. Um, I do believe that by tracking individuals through the carceral churn allows us to see age as more than a static uh, um, characteristic of offenders, but rather as a process of embodying these linkages between different places, uh, even places of disconnection, uh, prisons, rehabilitation houses, shelters, places that make up the carceral circuit of carceral churn in a super age society. Dominant models of resettlement based on useful bodies and independent aging fail to recognize the ways in which these ex-offenders uh, embody time, the way they do their time, uh, the rhythm of this unsettled heart, the churning grind of survival on livelihood assistance, for example, the back and forth from the easy inside to the uncertain outside. The increased attention to the situations of older and disabled people in Japanese prisons has prompted some movements towards limited criminal justice reform. However, these reforms are unlikely, I think, to produce any substantial change unless they are linked to broader abolitionist and anti-ageist projects uh, and collaborations with ex-offenders themselves. Um, dismantling carceral churn requires new infrastructures that can empower community organizations with specialists uh, in support of older people. Uh, and this requires uh, an also a new kind of existential architecture uh, or interpersonal architecture, one that heals and provides hope and can be the foundation of new networks uh, for relational life to emerge across ages and other forms of distance. So I wanted to show you these two last pictures I, I took uh, of uh, G. Um, and um, the picture on the right uh, is G and one of the other ex-offenders. Uh, and uh, this was on a visit to a clinic where he was being screened for dementia. And it was a it was a nice moment in a way. I mean, he he was a I mean, you, this could be a very dark moment, right? People don't want to know, uh, be diagnosed with dementia. Uh, but he seemed quite at peace with it. And I think he was uh, quite happy to have us around with him, uh, taking him to this, looking after him in this way. Um, 
And of course, the, the staff there, the clinic staff, are always misrecognizing us as somehow connected to him, part of his family, maybe. Uh, who else would be doing this? Um, so it was almost as if in that context, we had sort of built other kind of ties, right? Alternative ties. And we could kind of imagine that different space. Um, the space on the left is, is a, a room in Mother House, the kind of open cafe area. Um, and yeah, here we have children um, that are coming into this space. Um, and G is kind of hanging out there. It's kind of a warm, open space here. Uh, again, reimagining what community could be uh, in, in a kind of uh, different, non-judgmental way. Um, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that and more about the kind of ways in which uh, I, I think there are these experiments happening and these third spaces uh, in which someone might be able to exit this kind of carceral circuitry in a way. Um, but uh, I will leave that uh, to you and questions. Um, and I'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you online. Well. Thank you. That was a very fascinating insight. Um, it's quite a good topic for Christmas, I, I thought, uh, as well. You know, as we deal with, well, you know, with some very, very much similar issues of uh, connection and loneliness. Mm. I wanted to start us off in the discussion um, with two things. Um, I thought one really interesting thing was that the um, the fact that you sort of started off with the idea, okay, maybe there's something expressive about the act of committing a crime and what what is stolen. And you had the pan and the mentaiko and the seeds, and that sort of it 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 created a particular kind of picture, but it it wasn't it didn't really go anywhere yes you reckon that there's, there's something at the pan there's something something homely about it but really it, it doesn't come together as a thing it's not a meal um or anything and then of course the second part of the talk focused on the function of committing the crime literally i mean uh, when ji san stole 20 yen for which you can't buy anything or hardly anything really when he said well I'm, i was hungry but clearly there was the idea that this it had a different function it, it was meant to get him to a different place i think that that distinction is is really quite interesting because when you when you think of the sort of the crime statistics um in in western cities for example where you have similar problems with urban alienation vandalism is sort of a big thing right mm -hmm. and vandalism in that case is usually it's read as an expressive act it's to, to destroy uh, something symbolically that that symbolizes um, part of society that that you sort of indirectly attack mm -hmm. but here there isn't there is uh, i i don't know whether, whether whether you saw anything that is sort of similar to that it seemed that people were quite clear. If I steal something, even something small, hopefully I'll be arrested and then um, I'll be taken care of again. Yes, <laughs> I was hoping that you would pick up on that. I know you're interested in uncanny objects of all sorts. Um, and uh, and I was hoping to to bring that, that out. So thank you for asking that question. Um, yeah, I think it's important to, uh, I wanted to point out how when we're talking about carceral circuitry, I guess, um, it's not only about people, but you know, objects are uh, sort of included in this, enveloped in this. Um, objects that move from one place to another and suddenly become something else mm. symbolically. And I think the objects, you know, maybe when she picked them up in the store, they're they're one thing. And when she gets the thought that I'm just going to leave and not pay mm. for these, and maybe I'll get away with it, and maybe I won't. They become something else. And then when she's caught, and they're they're become loaded with a different kind of symbolic uh, weight, right? So um, I think objects too get caught up in this in this churn, right? right. Um, the 20 yen, right? That symbolic kind of thing. I think the in, in reading, I've, I've come across a lot of examples of this. In fact, the, the, um, uh, the kind of official statistics um, say that the average value of the objects stolen uh, by uh, older adults, and most of this is shoplifting. The average value comes out to about three thousand yen. Right. So, and in most cases, it's very little, right? Mm -hmm. And it is this, um, 
you know, crime is kind of symbolic, right? right. And this is sort of showing that. Yes. I think it's not uh, probably, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot too, uh, and this act of theft. Why is theft and shoplifting uh, so prevalent? Why is that the crime of choice, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, it's not for everyone, right? Uh, and uh, especially, I think, if, if you want to be in prison for longer, you're going to do something else because you're going to get a very short sentence for right. kind of shoplifting. And I don't think it, we can um, just say, well, it's just this sort of rational thing. They're, they're, they're poor, they're hungry, they're desperate, right? As we can see in the case of Miss T, she had money. Mm. Uh, and other folks that I talked to said, well, I had money, um, but uh, I did it anyway. Um, uh, and I think this this sort of uh, act of, of stealing, of sort of violating or inverting those sort of norms of, of consumerism, right? Mm -hmm. To me, with the increased marketization of, of elder care and that kind of welfare landscape, right? Huh. Um, the, this idea that we're sort of shopping for care uh, in right. Japan these days. Um, this act of stealing seems like a, you know, in the same way as vandalism, a kind of... Um, <laughs> you know, potentially sort of politically uh, loaded act, right. whether intentional or not, right. right? That becomes the mode in which these uh, this is expressed, right? This unease, mm -hmm. this anxiety is expressed. Um, those who can't live up to that sort of right. ideal, yeah. those that can't be involved in that market economy of, of care, mm. um, that this is kind of a refusal of that. Yes, and that I, makes perfect sense, okay, yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have lots of other questions, but uh, please, I, I'm sure uh, there's questions in the room. Um, and maybe there's also something um, online. There's, or is that, an, is that an old question? Sharon's got it. Oh, yeah. Shall I, shall I read it out? And, uh, <laughs> that you can think. You can do your best, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Sharon. Thank you for your question. Um, so the question is, is there a connection uh, with the baby boomer Dankai Sere generation and the openness of these people to crossing the line and considering prison as an alternative way of attaining care? There seems to be a sort of boldness that might be also about a certain kind of generation with a certain kind of earlier life. Mm, mm. Um, I think that's very interesting. Um I remember being told by a, a woman who's a, a former probation officer. Um, uh, I was talking to her uh, about this and why we have this sort of decline in juvenile offenders. And, uh, you know, um, that's partially, you know, the, the reason why we have a growing proportion of older people in the prisons. Uh, and she just kind of said, well, you know, genki ga nai, like, you know, old young people these days, genki ga nai. And, you know, and, and these these older people, that generation, Dankai no Sedai, they're ginky, right? They're they're going to do these kind of things. Right. And so there might be something to to this. Um, you know, that's an interesting theory. Um uh, and and it, there is a sort of logic there that there would be this kind of generational um connection, perhaps. Um but I, I I don't know. I, I do I do certainly think that um, there is something perhaps to the experience of the ways in which life has changed for people over the course of um, the, their lifetime, right? So you know the the situation of the, the sort of welfare environment or the kind of care system and things like that, that's changed. Like right? longevity has changed, you know, families have changed uh, and quite rapidly. Um, and, um, you know, the, the kinds of ways of life, perhaps that a lot of these guys in, uh, you know, in the, in the Yoseba and they places like that used to live, um, and right. That, that sort of environment has, has changed a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and so that, that might be, so maybe this, this generation is, is quite ginky and they're, they're, you know, it's, it's difficult for them to, to, uh, to then change that and to, uh, you know, what the current climate is or something. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but certainly not everybody of that generation, right? right. It's not characteristic of that. There's there's lots of, of other people who uh, have different trajectories, follow different trajectories mm -hmm. in age, right? So. Um, there is something thrilling about it, I'm sure, even mm -hmm. at any age, right? To think, okay, I'm just going to take these things. 
just going to walk out and see what happens. And, uh, you know, maybe yes. But I like the idea of boldness. Is, uh, definitely right, right. So, so that is interesting. A lot of times people didn't really want to talk about mm. what they did that ended up, that, you know, getting them into prison. Right. Um, but that would be really interesting to 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 be able to 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 look more into that sort of affective dimension of mm. of of theft. I think it's one way. Mm. Yes, yes, please. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, I was really interested in the um, relationship between community in your work with with the NGO and um, and in your interviews and um, kind of notions of transgression. It seemed that. Uh, you were kind of swinging between creating a community for people when they were um, ex offenders, and then when they were in the interviews when they were lonely, they were when they got disconnected, they um, transgressed in order to re enter the, car in the prison community. So, I wondered if you mm. had the impression that that was a solvable problem for your work with the NGOs, whether, um, you know, the Jisan was was reading, perusing her bureaucratic bureaucratic notes from the state. Uh, it is this kind of act of connection with the state. Mm. And so, do you think that that's something which which can be worked upon? Is this a community mm. problem that can be solved? Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was almost like you know uh, the way someone would read through letters or Christmas cards or something like that. You know, they're they're kind of scattered there. They're kind of something that he wants to connect with, but. It's difficult to say, you know, maybe he's think, thinking, oh, I got to remember I had an appointment or something like that. Maybe there's just something that keeps coming up in that way. But um, uh, yeah, I think I, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting observation. Um, I, do, I do think that it is, it, there is a need for uh, creating different spaces of connection, right? So the, the typical model of sort of ex-offender resettlement is go back to work. Right, uh, get a job. Once you get a job, you'll you'll have money. You'll be able to resettle. You'll be fine. Um, that is so. All of the effort is put on getting a job. But older people can't get jobs, right? A lot of especially if you're older and disabled. Um, the other way is to go back to your family, right? And most of these older people, they're they're estranged from their family. A lot of times, the, the stigma of incarceration is so great. Families just cut off the ties, right? Um, and so those kind of modes of, of relationality are, are really just foreclosed on them. What do they have left? They have these sort of, you know, there are sort of these temporary sort of transient modes of community that they might find in a place like Sanya. But again, I want to emphasize that it is really quite precarious for a lot of people, uh, especially ex-offenders. So um, so I, I think there needs to be uh I think more greater visibility. I think we need to uh have more of a voice for these people. I need it needs to be destigmatized, uh, right, in a way. And I think more encounters and more uh sort of chances uh to to meet people uh across these divides of age as equals, um, right, uh is is important, is is critical for this, right? Um, and so um I see Hibiki san there in the back, but I think uh, you know arts uh, and uh, those kind of uh, activities, right? That can sort of cross these different boundaries in lots of different ways, for example, and connect people are something that are really important, right? Right now, those kind of arts or those different kinds of connections uh, are not being made, especially with people that are inside of prisons, right? So we need to be able to lower that wall a bit get the outside, you know, sort of organizations into prison, working with people before they're released. You have them outside in the communities, right? Uh, working perhaps with the formal care system, but also, um, you know, with uh, ex-offenders, with uh, artists, with others, right? Uh, and, and the community and build that. It's a very ambitious kind of vision, perhaps, um, but I think it's where we have to go. So really, really quick question. Can prisoners vote? That's a very good question. I don't know the answer. It's a little polemic in England whether prisoners should have the vote or not. Yeah. It'd be interesting to know whether they feel that they can participate in society at that Hmm. That's interesting. I have to look that up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Anybody else? Yeah, I do think uh, having a, more of a political voice in some way, right, is important. And sort of these tojisha uh, groups and movements, I think, are important for that. A lot of these, uh, but anyway, <laughs> other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, um, probably um, not a very good thing to think, but um, do you think, um, like, it's the problem with the prison systems being very accommodating, so a very attractive place for these people to go to. Um, is it possible that this is a failure of the prison system? So if it's made not as comfortable, yeah. then people won't want to go in. In, in the first place, do you think that could be the case? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure that would be necessarily the case. I mean, lots of ways in which prisons are not comfortable places, right? Um, I mean, you're constantly under watch, for example, right? Kind of everything you do is on, is being watched. You're you're in this environment with with all these other people, right? And it's. I mean, there are some ways, right? And Miss T was saying, you know, like she's got work and it's good and she feels valued and these things and a lot of, you know. Uh, older people kind of say this is you know the only place I can I belong right or the stigma of incarceration doesn't matter so um um but I think as long as there are older people in there they got to be taken care of right or else this is really you know we're talking about cruel and unusual um and right on a human rights level that that is just not right, right. Yeah. um so um I, I I agree that I mean I, I do think that uh, we should be working on alternatives to prison rather than making the prisons nice. Or maybe we should have alternatives uh, to prison for people who are disabled, who are have dementia, or people who are uh, older to be able to go to rather than prison. And we need more of those. Um, so that's important. We also need more sort of education of people, you know, throughout this sort of, you know, you know, from police to, to uh, you know, judges to all these people that are involved in that uh, in order to get uh, older offenders who, um, uh, yeah, into those spaces, right? To those alternatives. Yeah. So I agree. Uh, I mean, one sort of paradoxical thing is that it's the disciplinary regime that seems to be the attraction, mm. the regimentation, mm. the idea, because you describe very, you know, yes. the, the, the sort of the temporal dimension mm. That, and that's that's very sort of it's it's a common experience also described yeah. by you know in ethnographies of homelessness this idea that if, if you're homeless essentially the temporal horizon is today you you never think beyond that and there's there's there is there is no resources and 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 the time to even think beyond what's happened you're so occupied with doing whatever you need to do to survive here and now that there is no beyond that and what you have in prison is is quite the opposite you have a, a regimented day that is always probably the same and it's so regimented that it is you you can completely give up on you know you don't have to think about what's happening next it will happen almost mm. automatically yeah i did find it interesting i went to i visited a couple of um older ex-offenders in uh, who were then transferred to kind of nursing homes or care homes after um they were released and uh uh, it was um, another kind of uncanny experience, right? Because they, um, you know, you could tell they were in the prison, right? They're, they're, the rooms were spotless, you know, they were cl totally clean. Everything was lined up. One guy even had written his his prisoner number, like on the on the on his like bottle of toothpaste, right? It was all lined up there on his on his sink. So in, in ways, these these embodied sort of habits of of the carceral. Um, environments have sort of carried over, transferred well, actually, a very model person in the nursing home, right? Um, but um, that's a bit disturbing as well, is, isn't it, right? And then settling. Yes. There's two more questions online. All right. So if you Shall I read them? Ahead. Okay, so one says, um, when older people are given their sentences, is there uh, an awareness in the judicial system that these people want to be in prison or seeking care? Uh, and how do they respond to this? Um, that's a great question, Anastasia. Um, and I don't know. And I think it's probably case by case. Um, I, I don't think that really uh, ends up mattering uh, in the end. That's my impression of the, the cases that I know about. Um, it's uh, they look at your your record. They look at, you know, if there's evidence of the crime. 
Uh, and unless there is someone there that's sort of advocating for you or family members, something like that, um, then it, you are likely to get prison time rather than a suspended sentence. Um, and that's been my impression. So the ways in which you know, presence of family is something that can divert you from this carceral circuitry, I think is important. Um, and it, it makes it very clear to me, at least, that what we're doing is criminalizing people who don't have those family connections, right? right? The people that we don't want to see, that sort of dark side of aging again. Um, I hope that answers your question in some way, <laughs> Anastasia. Um, it, always things, more things to know. Um, Sadie says, uh, would it reduce recidivism better to increase investment in social care uh, rather than investment in appropriate provision for the uh, elderly in prisons? Um, I do think that there should be an increase in investment uh, in, in social care. Um, I think, uh, and in some places, this is happening, right? So they have these community resettlement support centers uh, in Japan. Um, this started in 2012. Um, they're in, across all the prefectures in Japan, um, but it, it's very uneven, right? So the you know basically the prefecture is given some money and said you got to set up some kind of resettlement center uh, and uh, figure it out based on what you need in your prefecture, and they use the money how they want to, and um, uh, it's it's you know sort of not a very good necessarily a good system, and it all sort of is based again on these private companies that are contracted by the state as well. Um, some do it, some do it well, uh, and you can see, uh, you know, I think those models uh, should be um, uh, should be, you know, looked at uh, more closely. Um, but uh, yeah, it takes a lot of of work. So it does take this investment, Sadie. It does take this investment. Um, you know, it takes a lot of sort of social workers and, and coordinating with the community and coordinating with different institutions uh, and following up on, on people uh, constantly um, and doing a lot of that work. So it does take investment. Um, and uh, but, you know, how much would it save? Yeah, right. Because the, you know, having someone in prison for such minor crimes over and over again uh, is also extremely costly. Uh, to Japan. So, um, are there any other questions here? And, and I know there's another question online. Yes, at the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you need a lot of representation, and you need a lot of people to help yeah. I just want to ask you about maybe two things. And uh, first one is uh, about uh, research methods, uh, your research, and how did you build relationships with uh, the people you researched? Because, you know, I think uh, there are many complicated things uh, that that went to into the process of uh, talking to people about like, very high age and uh, sensitive uh, Spot. Yeah. So yeah, I'm just wondering the research methods. And the second question is, uh, yeah, actually, uh, you know, how to uh, I tried to interview with the people uh, living in Sanya, and uh, he had experience uh, in prison, and uh, and he said he started living on the street because he didn't want to go back to prison, mm. and. Uh, and at the same time, he said, of course, once he entered, once he gets into the prison, he could get the clothes and the clothes and shelter. But uh, more than that, he didn't like the feeling of being tied to someone and by someone. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. And he's about 15 years old. So mm -hmm. I think it was easier for him to uh, make some choice to spend time on the street, mm -hmm. some in prison, uh, compared to the older people. Uh, but I'm just wondering, uh, did all the people you researched mention anything about the findings and rules? Mm, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'll try to answer this quickly. Um, uh, I'll do the second one first, right? So um, yes, they. I mean, they did often talk about how it, 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 you know, there was no freedom in in 
in prison, right? Um, that was a, sort of a common thing. Uh, I don't know if you know they, they use quite use those words of being sort of bound down there. Um, but I think especially in Sanya, you find a lot of guys who, you know, throughout their lifetime have been very independent, right? Going out on their own, maybe moving from somewhere uh, else, you know, being a you know, day labor or something like that, where they're, they're sort of making their own way. And I think that kind of uh, personality, right, was kind of prevalent among a lot of people that I, I met there. Um, so even saying, you know, I'm fine, I can, I can, I can be on the, on the streets, you know, uh, and those guys are tough and they're resilient in a lot of ways, right? Um, when they get older, when you're talking about in your 80s and things like that, you know, there's more things that come up perhaps, but, um, so that, so things might change for this individual. I'm not sure, um, but again, I think there are different these different trajectories and different ways, uh, different ways in which people might end up in prison. Not necessarily voluntarily. I don't want to say that's the only way. Um, the other thing about methodology, um, yeah, um, I just spent as much time as I could in in these places uh, and uh, tried to. Uh, uh, I worked with uh, different, I uh, worked with, I did volunteer, right, uh, with these different organizations doing different things. So I was there every day, all day, just talking to whoever I could, uh, building rapport, building sort of a relationship. Um, and people knew what I did, they knew who I was. And, um, you know, gradually when I built these relationships, then when I get introductions or I would get, um, you know, different sort of doors would open. Um, and uh, some some individuals were happy to talk with me, some not. Um, and um, so that's that was sort of uh, it's a bit messy, um, but um, but that's that was my sort of initial um, way. Uh, I mean, Sanya was a tricky place to to do that research. It, I mean, you really do have to commit to to really being there for a long time with with folks um, because again, there's. <laughs> hard to build trust in a situation like that. So going through the NGOs, working through them, they really knew the area well and uh, were able to help me out. Um, so, good. Excellent. There's Should one I more take already. Anne's class yes. question here? Great. Oh, oh and Peter has one. Oh. All right. Um, oh, and Sharon said she had to leave. Goodbye, Sharon. Um, all right, so uh, Anne says, um, Thank you for your presentation. What is the gender distribution of the elderly in the carceral system in Japan? It seems like there are more elderly male prisoners, but what's the percentage of women? Can you tell us more uh, about why the recidivism rate is highest among uh, elderly in prison in comparison to younger inmates? Are there programs in place for re-socializing the imprisoned elderly? Lastly, um, what are types of elder care uh, provided in prison? Um, Okay, lots and uh, lots of questions there. Um, I uh, thank you and thank you, Anne, for all of those. <laughs> um, so I wasn't able to enter into Japanese prisons and do a kind of prison ethnography there, um, unfortunately. But these are very difficult places to get inside, as you may know. Um, so I, it's really difficult for me to say much. It's all very secondhand, thirdhand about what happens as far as elder care provided in prisons. Um, I know that in some prisons, they do have these sort of specialist wings uh, and special care for older people, uh, but this is not the norm. Uh, and uh, from what uh, I heard mostly about from, from slightly younger uh, ex-offenders who, um, uh, you know, were telling me about older people in prison uh, were the ways in which other prisoners had to be caring for um, the the older and disabled prisoners. Um, so if someone needed a changing their their you know diapers, their, their clothes, uh, taking a bath, if they needed help with any of those things, it was often the other ex offenders that were told you have to do that and to help them out. Um, and uh, they weren't giving any any instruction. There was no training or anything. They were just told do it, and so they had to learn on the fly. And it's not the best kind of care. Um, so uh, that was uh, the kind of picture that I got most uh, uh, clearly. Um, but again, I think this might be changing gradually, unevenly, um, but uh, um, that's one thing. Um, another thing is about uh, gender uh, yeah. there, um, which I, I do think is important. Again, um, 
partially there's a you know methodology uh, access uh, issue I wasn't able to um, interact that much with um, uh, all their female ex offenders um, uh, so uh, so it's difficult for me to say too much about that um, it, it is a much smaller group than than men um, as it is in most places. Uh, in the world uh, where we have. Um, so, uh, uh, and, um, you know, from what we can tell by things like statistics, um, I can't, I can't say how much they are. I know that they are also a growing proportion of the uh, female incarcerated population, um, growing even faster, I think, than, um, than the male incarcerated population. But uh, again, that's because probably there's a lot fewer female uh, um, prisoners in general. Um, so statistics are kind of hard to judge there. Um, we know their numbers are growing. Uh, we know that, you know, 80% of the, the crimes uh, that are landing women in prison are shoplifting, um, uh, things like that. But we've also know that uh, there, there seems to be, uh, and this is from other people's research uh, with uh, older female ex-offenders, uh, more mention of domestic uh, issues. So kind of like Ms. T there, um, sometimes there are conflicts at home, sometimes there are things happening in the family that uh, are um, sort of propelling them uh, um, to commit a crime. Uh, whereas in the case of the men, it's more of these isolated men. So that seems to be a very important different gendered experience. Um, Sorry, do we? Shall we? Let's I, let's take Peter. Okay. Peter, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't answer all of your questions, Anne. But let me go to Peter's question. Near the end of your talk, uh, you, I think you mentioned uh, that Japan has an unusually high proportion of older people in its prison population. Um, a start of your talk. Sorry, uh, is this because the proportion of total older people in prison is unusually high in Japan, or rather the opposite that the proportion of younger population in a prison in Japan is unusually low? Uh, and uh, as you suspect, yes, uh, it's low and it's declining uh, for the younger people, right? So the the numbers of older people in prisons has sort of leveled off in recent years, um, but their proportion has, is, has grown um, a bit. Uh, and again, that's because overall crime rates are declining, and that's mostly we have fewer and fewer younger people in there. Uh, Anne asked this question about, you know, what's what about younger people? Uh, why are they they not um, reoffending as much as older people? Um, and I think that is because more often. Younger people are um, released on parole, right? On karishaku, right? They're they're getting out um, uh, to finish their sentence in the community because they have an, a family member or something that uh, agrees to act as their kind of guarantor. Uh, most older offenders don't have that guarantor, and so they they get out on monkey shaku. I mean, they, uh, they they do their whole sentence in prison. And they get out and they get sort of no support, right? The younger offenders, they'll get probation officers, they'll get checks, they'll get a lot of assistance with finding jobs. Um, there's a lot of resources that tend to be focused on them. And historically, this is the, sort of the case. The model is, okay, young people are the offenders. So we come back into the community uh, and um, get them a job and things like that. Um, but now uh, that's not so much the case and the system has not adjusted. Um, and there aren't uh, yet uh, the kind of strong supports for older people. So uh, in addition to having, you know, more support for people uh, coming out on, you know, this after serving their full sentence, I think that it would be good for Japan to look again at these rules about uh, parole um, and uh, trying to get guys out earlier uh, and women as well, um, uh, into the community and have this transition period. Um, and, you know, it, the data shows that if you, if you do that, the recidivism rate is much, much lower. I think that's a big part of it. Right. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that's these are all the questions. Um, it's a very interesting discussion. Thank you also for the participants online. Join me in giving a big round of a round of applause. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> a round of applause, then. <laughs> Turning German. <Thank> um, <laughs>
Thank you. for an excellent talk. Um, join us again. I hope you have a very nice break. Uh, do take care. Don't fall down. Don't go skiing. Too dangerous. Um, and do join us again on the 11th of January, first week of new term. We have our first event um, with the uh, artist, translator, and writer Polly Barton. And, I've already booked. Uh, I've already registered. I'm so excited for Polly Barton. Excellent. Yes. No. It, it will be. It will be sort of a, a mix event. We'll just have a conversation, but it will be an opportunity also for you to ask questions about her experience in Japan, about her writing. She's won the uh, essay prize, Fitzgeraldo um, essay prize for her long essay on the Japanese language called amazing. 50 Sons. It's really an amazing, amazing. I recognize so many moments and I thought, yes, this is exactly <laughs> yeah. it. This is a, yeah. why didn't I think of that? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so please do come back and have a safe journey home and good switching off on the online side. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone.